so this slide is related to saving and reloading programs in controller. So you have these um, disk icons uh, at, on your toolbar. And so the first one is just to save the configuration. It's kind of an unprompted save. It uses a, kind of a default naming convention, and it stores in the default project folder. The middle disk icon, you can probably see it better on your screen, but it has like a little yellow X on the disk label. And that's to save as, you know, it'll prompt you for a folder uh, location and a file name. So saving means take a program from the controller and save it onto your computer. And then the disk icon with the red arrow is to load a device archive, which means take a program from the computer and put it into the controller. And when we load a configuration into a controller, there are some things that we don't change, um, and that includes the um, the controller's address, including all the backnet settings, as well as the description. So those don't get updated intentionally because we think when you're taking a program from one controller and pushing it into many, those are things that you don't want to copy the same addressing and descriptions into all of the controllers. So an example of that would be, here's my 8100 controller. If I just go to this first disk icon and hit save, nothing really happens. Doesn't look like anything happens, I should say. But if I go to my file explorer and go to C, ASI control projects, I have a folder named October 26, October 26 training. And so if I sort by date modified, I can see that it did just save a file in the last minute. The name was A1 because it's a pre-programmed controller, uh, 8100 because that's the model number of the controller, and 18100 is the ASI address of that controller. And then it has a .asi file extension. That's this kind of a compressed format that ASI expert knows how to read. You can't open it with in a word or not in any usable way with word or notepad or anything like that in kind of a compressed format. If I go hit the middle disk icon for save as, then that lets me choose a different folder, lets me choose a different file name. So sometimes I'll create a new folder with this little icon, like the folder with a star. And sometimes I'll call it back up or templates or something like that. And so then if I save it into my backup folder, then I can give it an English, you know, uh, more descriptive name, uh, maybe like heat pump. And so now I'm just going to change a couple of things just to show you that um, so basically what I saved has everything that's in this controller. But I want to show you, I'm going to change Let's see, where's the configure tab? I'm going to change the cooling clock temp SP. I'm going to change it from 79 to 74, just to show you that when I reload, it will change that value. And I'll change the heating lock temp SP from change from 77 to 72. I'm also going to change the description from RTU 10,005 to HP 10,005. And so we'll see that the set points when I load the program, those are going to go back and change according to the file I load in, but the description is not going to change based on the file I load in, and that's intentional. And so this just a couple of settings just to show you that it does change most things, but not everything. So there's that, um, the background of the setting is marked in yellow, which means I can click send to push it down into the controller. And so now if I were to go to the load disk icon and go into my backup folder and pick that heat pump configuration that I saved, when I click open, I would expect the cooling and heating occupied temperature set points to 
change based on these settings that were in here, but I don't expect the description to change because that's filtered out during the load. So when I click open, you can see those change back. They are marked in yellow, which means I need to push send to push them into the controller. And now this is running the same program. Um, and I'm not sure why the backnet settings went away, but if I click on the home icon and come back to the controller, there's my backnet settings are here again. But those settings also would not change due to a configuration file being loaded. We filter those out because those are things that once they're set in the controller, you usually want to leave them in there. So that's uh, how you can save and reload controllers. As far as RS-485 networks go, whether they're ASI protocol or backnet MSTP, um, there's some important information to know. Um, and most of this information is also contained in this TechNote 23, which is an older document that we wrote a long time ago, but there's still some good information in there. So I still actually use that in training. And it's in that virtual training files zip file that uh, I gave you the link for. So if you've just been looking at the virtual training files as a zip file, you might want to copy those files and extract them out as individual files, as kind of real files on your computer, either on your desktop or my documents or somewhere that it's easy to find. Um, but one of those files is TechNet 23. You actually could probably open that as a PDF right out of the zip file, but some of these other ones we're going to use, especially for IntelliFront, you're going to want to have them extracted out. So TechNet 23, if I open that as a PDF, then you can see it was written 15 years ago, but it still has some good information that we still follow. And so this is the um, recommendations we have in terms of using shielded communication wire, how to terminate the shield. And it's a little different than the way I learned it um, before I started working for ASI controls. And I think it's a little different from the way a lot of people learned it. Because um, the way I learned it was to take all the shield wires and twist them together and then ground them at the first or last controller in the daisy chain. And the way it's described here, um, and it makes some sense after I talked to our guys in engineering that recommended this, um, I think there are good reasons to do it this way. But the way we do it is we terminate and ground one side of each segment of the shield wire. So none of them are twisted together. So the segment from controller one to controller two, we ground it at controller one. The segment going from controller two to controller three, we ground that at controller two. And so one of the reasons that we recommend in this format is if you have them all twisted together and landed at say the first controller, then that can be a pretty long path to ground for any noise or whatever's coming in on the shield wire if it's something that's picked up at the end of the daisy chain. Then it's, it's a longer path to ground and it passes by the communication wiring for all of the controllers. And so I would never recommend anybody go back and re-terminate their shields for a network that is communicating well. But for new projects, I think there are some advantages to terminating the shield this way. The red and the black wires are shown there just to show that we are polarity sensitive, so all the minuses need to go together as the black wire and all the positives need to go together as the red wire. Um, there's some other useful information in here. It, most of it's general RS-485, but make sure every controller is grounded because the uh, what, what we do for communications, we're varying DC voltage on those plus and minus wires and their reference to ground. So if, if any of the controllers have ground references that are much different than the other controllers, then that can affect communication. Um, it does recommend not running the communication wiring close to AC power, but if you do, then make sure you're using shielded wire. Um, there's a mention here about not exceeding 32 controllers on any 45 bus. It really should say 32 loads, um, but each of our controllers are full load devices. Um, the RS-45 spec says no more than 32 loads, and some 
controllers that you see out there. I've, I've heard of half and quarter load devices. Somebody even mentioned that there's eighth load um, devices, although I, I don't think I've seen those. Um, so in a BACnet system, if you had, say, uh, 30 ASI controllers on that network, you could actually add four more non-ASI half-load devices, because four half-loads would be two loads. So the 30 ASI loads plus the two non-ASI loads would be a total of 32 loads. Um, it's not mentioned in this doc, but you also have a limitation in terms of wiring length. And so in the daisy chain, it should be no more than 4,000 feet entire length of the RS-45 bus. Um, there's a mention here about not using multiple pairs of cables. So, um, you know, sometimes I've heard of people that like to run two pairs in case something happens to the first pair, then they have a backup pair that they can use um, without having to run new wire, which at, it makes some sense. But if you're going to do it that way, then the unused pair in the beginning, you do need to ground as if it was the shield wire. Um, meaning terminate one side and land it to ground. Otherwise, you can get an un, uh, unused pair connect like an antenna with no path to ground. Um, and then here is a communication wire specification. So um, whatever comm wire you're using, um, make sure that it meets our specification. Um, so the wire, we mentioned a gauge. The gauge I don't think is actually quite that important. Our, our RS-45 terminal block, um, actually I think can accommodate um, a pair of 18 gauge wires, which would mean one wire in, one wire out. Uh, this part here, the number of conductors, it says two, which is one twisted pair. That kind of goes along with the don't use multiple pair communication wiring. And the, the twist is important too, because there's some science to the twist. So there's so many twists per foot, and that's somehow supposed to improve the communication reliability as opposed to like thermostat wire, which might not have any twist or, or less twist compared to communication wire. So you do want to make sure it's a single twisted pair um, for the best result. And then any communication wire should also have a capacitance uh, specification. And there should be for shielded wire, you should have two capacitance numbers. One is between the conductors, plus and minus, and lower is better. So your wire should be no higher than 24 picofarads per foot. And then for shielded wire, you should also have a separate capacitance number for between either of those conductors, plus or minus, and the shield wire, and lower again is better. So it should be 42 picofarads per foot or less. Um, I think that's usually referred to as um, mid-cap wire, I've, uh, like lawn communication, I think requires low-cap wire. I think it's 12 and a half picofarads per foot between conductors. So that should work fine because lower is better, but um, the lower capacitance wire tends to be more expensive. And then here also there's another mention of don't use more than one pair and if you do have more than one pair, terminate them as if they were the shield wire. So I think that's also relevant information. Um, it goes on to explain some, there's some more very technical information that I haven't found very useful about measuring voltages and that sort of thing. I, I have not used this to, at this level, but I do refer to the information um, on the first couple of pages. Uh, that is related to the RS-45 network. Uh, controller addressing, this is for the ASI address uh, as opposed to the BACnet address. And so in ASI Expert, the a ASI address is shown on the configured tab as this device address here, which is different from the BACnet address that we call the BACnet device instance. And so notice that it's grayed out because there's only certain times that you can actually change this address. 
And so take a look here. So for the ASI address, you're limited to addresses between one and 65,000 with some exceptions. Uh, multiples of 256 are not allowed. Those are reserved for what we call group addresses. And that's um, so that we can change settings in a group of controllers with one command. There's addresses in the 23,000 range that are reserved for what we call global addresses. And that's to ch make a change that affects all controllers of a certain type. And then there's also addresses in the 46,000 range that are reserved for what we call initialization addresses. And that's to do certain kind of housekeeping, um, mainly in ASIC-1 controllers, there's one primary initialization address. And that's um, the one we use with what we call an interlock. And the interlock is set by shorting input three to common. And you can either do that at the controller or um, I'll, I'll show you a picture of our microsync device, which is kind of a USB powered um, temporary communication interface. And the interlock, we use that for a few different functions. One is to find the address of a controller that we don't know the address of. Um, it's also to change the address. And then the third one we don't use quite as often anymore, but there's with one click, you can restore the controller to its factory settings. Um, more commonly now, people just load a configuration that has the settings that they want, including the factory settings. Um, it's important that only one controller at a time have that interlock installed because there can be certain cases where, um, like when you're changing an address, what you're really doing is saying, I want to change the address of the controller with the interlock. And so if multiple controllers have an interlock installed and they both hear the same address message, um, then they'll both change their addresses, which is usually not what you want. And then the 8100 controller has a special, what we call it the soft interlock action. That actually lets you, um, without having physical access to the controller, um, you can set the interlock temporarily for 30 seconds so that you can change the address. There's, there's one customer of ours that did a lot of work with the 8100 controllers, and a lot of it was um, in remote locations. And there were cases where they would need to change the address remotely. So we added that to the 8100. We've never added it to the 6100. No one's ever really asked us to. Uh, I think that's the last ASIC-1 slide it is. And so what I usually do for initial programming of ASIC-1s is connect to them with a microsync. And let me show you what a microsync looks like. So let's close out from here and go back and i think it's further down on the page there's our microsync so it's a little portable communication device um, it's got a usb it's like the squarish usb port on the back like a printer has and so it's usb powered by your computer and then there is a uh, modular jack here. It's not an Ethernet jack. I think it's it's an RJ12. So I think that's six conductors wide as opposed to eight. So that's like a phone cable plugs in there. And then there's a number of adapters depending on how you want to connect to the controller. So in this case, this adapter, which is how I'm going to, I have one on my desk that I'm going to use for this case. And so you can plug directly into the wall sensor jack of an ASIC-1 to do the initial setup, which might be setting the protocol BACnet or ASI protocol, as well as the other settings related to communication so that when you install them in the field, you can power them up and they'll all start talking without getting in each other's way. Um, there's this find button, which is like a spring-loaded button, um, and that will allow you to short input three through the RJ12 cable. So that way you can short the input without having to have physical direct access to the controller. You just need to have wall sensor access to the controller, either by if you're plugging in here or there's ways you can plug in through a wall sensor. So I mentioned that the WS-0X1 wall sensors um, allow you to plug into the wall sensor instead of directly to the controller. Uh, there are red and green communication lights. Red is the C, green is transmit. And then, and this is all for ASI protocol use, the, the microsync is. 
Um, and so even when an ASIC-1 controller is configured for BACnet on its MSTP port through the wall sensor jack, it's still always ASI protocol. So the MSTP port, uh, the, excuse me, the RS-485 port can be configured for MSTP, but the wall sensor jack is always ASI protocol. And that's for either direct connection with the microSIC or through a wall sensor. Um, and then for ASI protocol RS-485 network, there's also um, a, plug, a green plug here. You can kind of see it better um, in, in this case. And so you can plug in um, a communication wire directly to the microSIC so that you can um, kind of do some testing on the RS-485 network itself, sometimes for troubleshooting or otherwise. Um, you need to do that sort of thing. So I have a microsync here that I'm going to plug into. So I'm plugging USB into my microsync. I've got the curly cable coming out that I've got plugged into my VAV controller. And so in ASI Expert now, I'm going to get out of this BACnet project because I just want to talk locally through my microsync. So I'll click on Project Browser here third toolbar icon from the left, and then I'll create a new project by double clicking on new project at the top. I'll call it October 26 training com. And if I don't select any of the connection options, then it's a complex project. So it's not ethernet, it's not telephone modem, it's not backnet, it's just going through a com port. I click OK. Then I'll go to the options button here. And that it should install as a USB serial port. Uh, Windows 10, I believe that automatically happens. If you have a Windows 7 computer, uh, you can go through Device Manager. And when you install ASI Expert, there's a Drivers folder. Um, and if you point the Device Manager at the Drivers folder, it should find the files it needs in, in the Drivers folder to install as a USB serial port. I'm going to select the ASIC-1 product family. And so if I don't know the address of my controller, I can leave the address field blank. Um, and what I want to do then to find the address, when I push this find button in, there's a little LED in that button, and it'll turn on the blue light when it's pushed in. That means it's trying to short input 3 through the RJ12 cable. And so if I don't know the address of my controller, I can leave it blank, select the ASIC-1 product family, click find it. And then it goes out and it basically says, hey, controller with the interlock, tell me your address. And it did, it said, hey, my address is 100. And then it displays this other information related, model number, address, firmware, description. And now the path to the controller is different. It's through COM4 at 19200 baud. And so I could change the address directly from this screen right here. And so I could click change address. Notice it says interlock required. It's reminding me that, hey, make sure that blue button's pushed in. I could make it 101, hit enter. Then it changed the address to 101. Confirms that, yes, I have changed your address. Click OK to upload from the controller. And so this is a case, this is ASI protocol. Notice MFTP enables unchecked and no. So I could go into the configure tab and possibly you know, change the address again if I don't want it to be 101. And that script running in the background is looking at this controller interlock. Controller interlock, yes, means input three is shorted. I'm going to push that find button so that it's, it's uh, not lit up, the blue light's off, which means input three is not shorted. Now controller interlock is no. Notice that the device address field is grayed out. So I can still see the controller's address. I just can't click on it to change it. I'll push that button back in. Controller interlock is yes. And now I can change it there. It's another way if I want to change it back to 100. This is, I can change it directly from the configure tab as well as from the find it screen. Um, on the status tab, I could change a description in the controller if that was part of my initial setup. 
And then on the BACnet MSTP tab, if BACnet, if I wanted to enable it, I could enable it and set these other settings in here if needed. So initial setup, uh, choose a protocol and then set the address and associated settings for that protocol. So these are your MSTP settings on the BACnet tab. On the configure tab, address and baud rate would be important because addresses need to be different. Baud rates need to be the same for all the controllers on the same network. Um, I think that's about what I wanted to show you there. We've got a little bit of time. Does anybody have any questions about initial setup of controllers related to, you know, the address settings or any of the other comm settings? question i think we'll actually jump ahead a little bit just because we have a little bit of time and this will give us more time tomorrow in case um, we need it and so i'm actually going to jump way ahead in the slides list uh, towards the end of the document and just a little bit about um backnet communication just a little background so that would be slide 108. And so BACnet, the BAC stands for Building Automation Control, Net is for Network. That's where the name comes from. There's two basic BACnet protocols now. There's BACnet IP, which is essentially BACnet over Ethernet. Not to be confused with the older BACnet Ethernet protocol, which you probably won't see that it's not been commonly used for quite some time, but there was originally something called BACnet Ethernet, which is different than BACnet IP. Um, there's also BACnet MSTP, where that is basically BACnet over RS-485. So MSTP stands for Master Slave Token Passing. Um, there are also BACnet routers that can convert from IP to MSTP. So it could take BACnet IP in and convert that to BACnet MSTP. So there may be a front end that only talks BACnet IP. There might be controllers that only talk BACnet MSTP. And so you can get a router to kind of join those two protocols together. Um, there are different uh, network numbers. Each subnetwork needs to have its own unique network number. So um, we saw that with our controllers that each ASIC3, that is kind of the host controller for each subnetwork, has a unique MSTP network. And then at the IP network, all the devices connected to the same Ethernet network should have the same BACnet IP setting. But every router should have a different MSTP setting. So we can see this is MSTP network one, MSTP network two, those are green. And then the BACnet IP network here is here in blue. Um, you might also see a reference if you're looking at a spec or maybe a customer mentions it or asks. There's something called BTL, BACnet Testing Lab. And so that's a kind of a testing agency that you have to send your controller to and they run it through all these communication tests to make sure that your controller uh, communicates according to the public BACnet protocol. It doesn't have anything to do with how well your controller works, if it can actually even control. It just means it can communicate. Um, and there are different listings available. There's um, some different listings for controllers and there are different listings for front ends. And so um, whether it's a spec or a customer request or whatever, they might ask about BTL listings. And so you can find that online too. Um, when I search for it, I usually search for I usually just type BACnet BTL. And then BACnet Testing Labs is usually the first hit. And then you can search a few different ways. If you browse by manufacturer, ASI Controls is listed there. And so we've got some controllers. Our ASIC3 controllers are listed as BACnet Building Controllers. B-BC is the kind of short name for that. So all ASIC 3s meet the, have the B-BC listing, and then the ASIC 1s have the application-specific controller listing, B-ASC. And the difference only is, or 
yeah, the difference really is the types of communication messages that that type of controller supports. So building controller supports more um, backnet message types than an application specific controller. Uh, so building controller is the highest level available for a an IO type controller. And then for front ends, there are um, there AWS's advanced operator workstation, which is the highest level for a front end. There's also OWS, which is just an operator workstation that has slightly less uh, messages that it supports. And so if you buy Niagara product from us, then that would support or can be purchased um, to support the, uh, either the AWS or the OWS spec. So if you ever get questions about that, that's where you can look. And so this is a summary of the different types of controllers we have that have backnet listings. And then I talked about some of this when we did the initial um, look at the ASIC-1 controllers in terms of their backnet settings, but just to point it out that it's here in the slides too. So there's the backnet device ID is its backnet address. And I mentioned earlier that it's important to know all of, if you're servicing a backnet system, especially if it has non-ASI controllers, it's important to know all of the backnet addresses on the entire network because if you ever add a controller, you need to make sure that it does not have uh, an address that's in use by another controller on the network because that would cause communication problems. And then some of the settings are only there for MSTP, and when meant there was that MAC address which is very different from a MAC address if you've ever looked at like uh, MAC addresses for network cards on your computer. You basically never change the MAC address for your computer. Um, but in MSTP, the MAC address, you're almost always going to change it because you need to um, change the MAC addresses so that on any local network, any local MSTP network, that every you want to make sure that every device has a different MAC address. So if we go back a couple of slides here, these three controllers all need to have different MAC addresses because they're on MSTP network one. These three controllers also need to have different MAC addresses relative to each other on MSTP network two, but the first controller or one controller on MSTP network two can have the same MAC address as another controller on MSTP network one because they're on different MSTP networks. And in fact, when we looked in ASI Expert, let me go back to my BACnet project. October 26 training, there's BACnet. So we saw that all of the rooftop controllers all have MAC address one, and that's okay because they're on different MSTP networks. This network field is its network number is the MSTP network. Likewise, all of the VAV controllers have the same MAC address of 12, but that's okay because they're on different MSTP networks. Uh, every controller on the same MSTP network needs to have the same baud rate. So that means on MSTP network one, they all need to have the same baud rate, perhaps 38.4. All the controllers on MSTP network two need to have the same baud rate. It could be something different than MSTP network one. So network one could be 38.4, network two could be 76.8. That's okay because they're on different networks. Um, there's this max master setting that we usually just leave set at 127. For the absolute optimum communication, what you would want is you would want to have your MAC addresses all sequential starting from zero. So the router is usually zero. So if they were zero, one, two, and three with MAC master set to three, because that's the highest MAC address on this very small network, that is ideal for the fastest communication. But what you usually see in the real world is that they're default to 127 and they leave them at 127. So that Way it's easy to add a controller without having to reprogram any settings. And functionally, I don't think you really would notice the speed difference, um, but that's what the setting is there for. I mentioned from that TechNote 23, 
the maximum of 32 loads or 4,000 feet per subnetwork. And every ASI controller is a full load controller. Um, if you're integrating with other backnet MSTP controllers, you might see half load or quarter load devices. So you just need to do the math accordingly. And then also I mentioned earlier, each subnetwork needs to have a unique network number. And that's whether it's a, an IP network or an MSTP network. That was back to this slide here. So these are three different networks. There's one Ethernet network, network number three, and there are two MSTP networks, one of them number one, the other one is number two. And so one nice thing about BACnet is that it supports discovery. When we just hit the who is button, that's when ASI Expert sends out that discovery message that basically says, if, if you talk BACnet, tell me more. And so that's convenient. However, on more sophisticated networks, when their controllers are not all on the same subnetwork, almost always those broadcast messages are going to get blocked by the routers so that they don't propagate between networks, which makes sense. Otherwise, they, you might have very chaotic networks if discovery messages just got propagated, you know, across different subnetworks. And so on either wide area networks or internet connected um, sites or projects, you, BACnet can actually get a little bit complicated to use. And usually what you end up having to include is what's referred to as a BBMD, BACnet Broadcast Management Device. And so that essentially allows um, two different BACnet IP networks to kind of get bridged together um, so that, and they need to know each other's IP addresses so that they know that it's okay to talk to each other. And that's actually, there is a BBMD on, on our network here that's allowing us to make this VPN connection because um, this is you know more sophisticated than a typical in-building local network. And so BACnet also has um, various objects um, similar to programmable ASIC-3 controllers in that there's objects and instances. And so within each object, there can be multiple instances. And for the I.O. points, almost always there's multiple instances, one for each of the binary outputs, analog outputs, binary inputs, analog inputs. So those are like the hard I.O. points. And then for software points, there's binary and analog values. Um, so again, binary is on, off, analog is numeric typically. And so binary could be like an alarm status point. Uh, for a binary value, an uh, analog value can be a set point in the controller that's not related to a hardware input or hardware output, but it's something that usually or that you might want to see in the back net front end. <clears throat> and then one of the other objects that we support is one called a multi-state value. It's kind of like an enumerated list. So the number one might represent one thing and the number two might represent something different. And so we use those for ASIC-1 overrides. Um, we don't use multi-state values in ASIC-3s. And then there's also the device instance, which there's only one instance of, and that just has some information about the controller, like its name, um, I think like its, uh, its BACnet address is in there. Um, there's usually some firmware information in there as well. And then when you're trying to read information from a BACnet point, you need to know which object type it is, binary input output value, analog input output value, something like that. And then also which instance. And um, this will become a little more clear, I think, um, on Wednesday when we are programming the ASIC-3 controllers and in that um, they start counting from zero in BACnet just like our ASI devices, or excuse me, instances do. Um, it's a little confusing at first because the first relay, a lot of people think of as binary output one, but both in our programming software and in BACnet, that's referred to as binary output index zero. So if, if you have um, uh, 16 outputs on a 9540 controller, 16 relays, then they're binary output instance zero through binary output instance 15. So if you've not worked with zero based um, counting before, it's, it's a little odd at first, but after you do it a few times, um, you start to just kind of do it intuitively. <clears throat> 
Uh, there's also what's referred to as a property in BACnet, and almost always from a front end standpoint, present value is the property that we want to um, to access. There's there's a bunch of other properties like out of service can be used to like uh, take an output um, and or an input. To, if you want to override an input, you have to set the out of service flag before you can write to the present value because an input's normally read only essentially. Um, and then when you're doing some data exchange, sometimes you need to know the data type. And so the next slide here talks about, at least from the ASI standpoint, these are the different data types that we use. So binaries are not what you might expect um, because by, when I think of binary, I think of Boolean, which is kind of you know digital on off, but in BACnet binary is actually enumerated. Um, and that's because there's like, true text and false text, that sort of thing. Um, so that enumerated again is number, like zero converts to some text, one converts to different text. Um, analog, input, output, and value, those are all real, meaning numeric with a decimal. Um, that I think is what you, you know, that makes sense. Uh, Multi-state values are what we call unsigned integers. So integer means it's a whole number without a decimal. And then unsigned, the sign is referring to a uh, positive negative sign. So unsigned means it can't be negative. Uh, it has to be positive. And in fact, multi-state values um, start from one. There's no zeros not used for multi-state values either. And then if you are using the out of service property like to override an input, then that would be a Boolean type to set the out of service property. And so this will become slightly more um, important uh, it, next week when we're working on IntelliFront, those people that are staying on for IntelliFront. 